first and last name? My first name is Jesse. My last name is Snodgrass. Have you ever sold drugs at Chaparral High School? Nope. You never sold drugs to any students there? No, sir. No? Okay. Do you know who this is? Nope. You sure? Yeah. Daniel? It was the first thing he said when I spoke to him on the phone. It was not, Mom, I got locked up, but he said, Mom, do you remember my friend? And I said, yes. And he said, he was a cop. The war on drugs is still going strong in America. Even though states like Colorado and Washington have legalized weed, federal grants still reward local police departments based on the sheer numbers of drug arrests they report, incentivizing local cops to target the most vulnerable. On December 11, 2012, 22 high school students were arrested in Temecula, California, a sunny suburb just east of LA. It was the culmination of what authorities called Operation Glasshouse, a 21 Jump Street style undercover sting. Adult police officers posed as students in two high schools. They went to class, did homework, and tried to get kids to sell them illegal drugs on campus. This is the story of Jesse Snodgrass, an autistic teenager who was one of the students arrested that day. At the beginning of his senior year, Jesse thought he'd made a new friend, a fellow student named Daniel Briggs. But this friendship was a sham. Daniel Briggs was in fact Deputy Daniel Zipperstein, a cop in his mid-twenties. Ever since his arrest, Jesse has suffered from PTSD, so he didn't want to talk to us on camera. But he wants his story known. His parents, Doug and Catherine Snodgrass, welcomed us into their home to talk about how Operation Glasshouse affected their son and what they're doing to fight back. This is the story of how the war on drugs preys on the most vulnerable. Did Jesse have many friends growing up? Well, that's always been a big challenge for Jesse. He has no friends. Senior year, he made a new friend, right? Yeah, it was huge progress. We felt it was a milestone in Jesse's okay. life. It, it seemed like a godsend to us. On one of the very first days of school, Daniel asked Jesse to, to get him some marijuana. So you do know who that is? Yeah. Do you know his name? Daniel Briggs. Have you ever sold Daniel Briggs drugs? We know that you sold drugs. But I just gave him some, because he was just all like, I need this. So Daniel asked Jesse to, to get him some marijuana. He also gave him some money, $20, to get it for him. Jesse didn't know where to get it. I started texting him relentlessly, making requests, you know, bugging him. He agonized over this for some time. He decided to go to a dispensary, a marijuana dispensary, and he found some guy who Jesse says he thinks was a homeless guy who was near there. And he gave him the $20 and got a very small amount of marijuana for it. And that's what he supplied to Dan. He was charged with two felony counts of selling marijuana. Oh, and there it is. Yep. That's the amount of weed. Mm -hmm. ha! $20, 0. 0.6 grams. <laughs> that's outrageous. I think he was really worried about how am I going to do this because if I don't, I'm gonna lose my friend. You know, his only friend. He was desperate. This is the beginning where he just sort of starts to retreat. And, you know, it's really hard to get his attention. You know, you would kind of clap your hands loudly in front of him and he wouldn't even flinch. At around age two, his uh, speaking just stopped. He just stopped. Being aware of things, he was just not here. You'll start noticing he's looking away from the camera almost all the time, where he would just sit in the corner by himself and kind of uh, wave his hand in front of his face like this for hours. His behavior was becoming more and more isolating. I went out of my way to find him play dates. Kids would come over and I would make sure they'd have a really good time because I'd want to kind of um, encourage any friendships. That would be one time only. I don't think he'd ever have more than one play date. Did you at all feel like the betrayal that ended up happening with the undercover cop was kind of like, there's echoes of various things that happened through his lifetime? Absolutely. Well, it was the biggest betrayal, um, but it was one more, you're right. 
he wasn't even upset at being locked up. He was just so upset that this person betrayed him. And he said, Mom, I was only trying to help him. I, I thought I was doing the right thing. And that people who do this are viewed as heroes, that's beyond me. Well, and that seems almost so, so insidious about it is that he was reacting out of empathy, that he was showing it by his actions. He was trying to help out a friend. Yeah. Which I suppose for his condition is quite remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, that was, for him to be able to do that was, you know, it would be considered a breakthrough under normal circumstances. <laughs> he was being bullied for being different. The word retard was used at him a lot. He still reacts really strongly to that word. In response to all this bullying that was happening, he was trying to make himself unapproachable. He cut his hair off, uh, cut it real short to like a buzz cut, uh, started wearing, um, you know, uh, t-shirts with like um, metal militia type logos. Gave him a tough guy persona. Most of the students knew Dan as a narc. On campus, his nickname was Deputy Dan because he was always asking for drugs, always asking, you know, like, you know, where I can get this, and if he would hear, he would jump into conversations just asking for drugs. Did Temecula have any sort of history as being kind of like a drug town, like where kids get high all the time? Not that we've ever heard of. Temecula was named the second safest city in America. Sebastian Eppinger and Jessica Flores were two other kids rounded up in the sting. It was my junior year, and I met this guy in my sixth period class. His name was Daniel Briggs, well, that's the name he was going by. I started hanging out with him at, like, break and lunch and all that. I just remember him walking over to our group one day and asking if he could sit down with us. And, of course, I just said, yeah, because anyone could sit with me. I don't... I don't judge. He started asking me to get him some marijuana or any kind of drugs I can get him, and I was just like, no, no, I don't do that, I don't mess with that. Right. But he just kept bugging me, so eventually I was like, okay, sure, I'll take you to someone. So I took him to a friend I knew. He um, gave me the money, so I'm like, okay, here. And then the guy took it out and put it on his binder. Uh-huh. And he was like, okay, just grab it off that. And I was like, okay, so I just grabbed it and put it in his hand. And he was like, okay, thanks, and he walked away. He would ask me every day, Every single day, he'd be like, hey, do you have this for me? Hey, do you have that? And I'd be like, uh, I guess so. I just decided, okay, well, I guess I should bring some so I can make some money off of him. He would always text me and be like, oh, can you bring me some tomorrow? I'm like, no, I don't have any at my house. He's like, I'm like, I don't, I'm not a drug dealer. I don't have anything. Did he seem like a student? We'd sit at a dance class. And they would leave the door wide open because they get sweaty in there. They'd be dancing in their booty shorts. Some of them would come outside and walk around occasionally. And I remember him looking over and just saying to our little group, he was like, damn, look at the ass on that one. She was probably 15 years old, so. What was it like when like the bus went down? I was in my house sleeping. These gang unit cops, there was like seven of them, came in my house and they like had all these bulletproof vests on and everything. They like picked me up out of my bed. They like get up and like they put me up against the wall and they like started patting me down. But I was only wearing my underwear, so they like kind of like like pulled down my underwear, kind of like, are you hiding any knives? I was like, I'm sleeping. I'm like I'm like I don't sleep with a knife. You know? <laughs> I was in my algebra two class. All of a sudden, these huge officers with their vests on and the full gear and everything, they come in. And they're like, oh, where's Jessica? And they grabbed me. They took me out the door. They pinned me to a wall, handcuffed me. The students were just staring at me. So I turned around and said, bye. That was all over the news that night. With a, a, a really bad headline. Riverside County Sheriff's deputies have smashed an illegal drug ring operating out of three high schools in Temecula. 22 students were taken into custody. It was like 21 Jump Street. Like Deputies say during the investigation, they seized all types of drugs, meth, cocaine, LSD, and ecstasy. Chaparral High School also had students escorted by police off campus. This picture shows one of five arrests made there. They broke up a drug ring in high schools. That's what they Temecula. called it. So that's, that's what they called That's it. what they called a kid buying half a gram, a gram of marijuana for his supposed friend. They called it a drug ring. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that seems kind of desperate. I mean, like, that's clearly not a drug ring. It's no. just kids being kids. At what point did you put it together and, you know, knew that Deputy Dan was actually a deputy? When they first um, brought us into the interrogation room, they were asking us questions, and then he just walked in his full uniform. Really? Yeah, and I was like... 
okay. I'm like, do you have a younger brother? Or, like, what's up with that? I thought, oh, so you're in trouble too? But then he wouldn't answer me. So he just, he just stood there like one of those British officers, you know, with the big heads. Yeah. He just stood there looking straight the whole time, didn't say a word, didn't turn to look, nothing. They treated us like we were hardened criminals that were like a menace to society and all that. That's what the DA was saying when we were in court. And he was saying that I was trying to sell him meth and I was offering all these different kinds of drugs. And it's like, I don't even know where to get that. I've never even mentioned that to him. That wasn't even the person that like brought it to him. I brought him to someone and they, he saw them take it out and put it on their body. I pretty much just touched it and gave it to him. They didn't even target that person. They targeted me. He probably thought, oh, this guy looks right. like he would have drugs, so I'm just gonna go after him and just keep bugging him. I'm just gonna make him have drugs. After taking him in and being so nice, like we don't have that many friends and so we're pretty much like we trust everyone we're like just trying to make another friend because i had no one to talk to so he's like picking on the loners on yeah kind of yeah because i was a loner too so yeah. i guess he was picking on the loners actually trying to make his job easier what a dick i know everyone seems to know immediately that jesse has some sort of neurological issues you know it, it's really obvious to people and he knew that Jesse was on medication too because he even asked Jesse to sell him his medication. Did you know Jesse, Jesse Snodgrass? Well, we were in the holding cells in Juvie. I just remember him sitting there. He, was, he looked so sad, just his face was pale, just looking at the ground. And everyone in the cell was like, wow, they would really do that to a kid like that. 22 kids were arrested as part of this drug sting. Nine of them were classified as special education. The majority were minorities, and this is in a city that is approximately two-thirds Caucasian. It seemed like there was a real need to get numbers. These might have been the easiest targets. And one thing that they consistently have trouble answering is to be able to properly define entrapment. That always gives them a lot of trouble. Okay? Yep. All right. On its surface, it's offensive. Mm -hmm. A child with autism in school where they're supposed to be a safe haven is exposed to this trained adult masquerading as a child whose sole purpose is to force kids to commit a crime that they wouldn't have necessarily committed otherwise. 21 Jump Street style undercover operations were pioneered by the LAPD in 1974. But they stopped their stings decades later because they found that they were disproportionately arresting poor, minority, and special needs kids, and that the scope of their busts made little impact on the illicit drug trade at large. But local law enforcement across the country, like Riverside County, continue to employ this tactic. He, hmm. he was dealing with a, a real bad case of uh, PTSD, so, right. you know, just seeing a police car would make him drop to the floor. There's an opportunity to save and, um, a countless number of kids from this happening to again. We reached out to Temecula Valley Unified School District and to the Riverside County Sheriff's Office a number of times, but they declined to comment on the story. The Sheriff's Office has said that seizing large quantities of drugs was never Operation Glasshouse's intent. All of the 22 students arrested in Temecula were charged with felonies, some for selling as little as a single pill because of California's zero-tolerance policy for drugs in schools. Only a few families were willing to talk to us, not because their kids were drug kingpins, but because the stigma of the arrest was something they'd rather bury. On a day that he returned to his high school, he usually likes listening to Nine Inch Nails, and this one particular song came on, and he just, like he did as a kid, just covered his ears and started to kind of shake and and started hitting my stereo to turn, you know, turn the music off. And I said, what is going on? He said, turn that song off. It was just such an overreaction. And he said, don't play music again. I don't want to hear that song. What was that song? It was called Hurt by Nine Inch Nails. The lyrics to that song actually um, spoke to him in a very haunting way. It's about betrayal, it's about losing everyone you love. Everybody I know goes away in the end. And this was... That was just the story of his life when he was younger. 
Of the 22 kids arrested, Jesse was the only one who didn't get expelled. And uh, that's because we were able to fight it. There are really horrible ramifications of this. None of these kids will ever be able to get a student loan. Their families are not able to live in public housing. Oh, God. Jobs that they'll never be able to get. They turn into our future prison population, unfortunately. But were you able to go back to school? No, not yet. It'll definitely be harder to get into colleges if they look at that stuff. That could be a major setback. Do you worry about that? Yeah. Yeah. My name is uh, Steve Downing. I'm a retired deputy chief of police for the Los Angeles Police Department. I was very involved um, at the time with narcotic enforcement when Nixon announced the war on drugs. My first hand experience taught me that it's a useless policy and uh, it's a very damaging policy. We've incarcerated 43 million people. We've ruined hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives, thousands of lives. Uh, by branding people as, as uh, uh, drug users. We've denied um, thousands of young people the opportunity to go to school through Pell Grants. With the prohibition of drugs, we've diverted our law enforcement and criminal justice resources away from public safety matters. When I started in the drug enforcement business, our goals was to reduce the flow of drugs into this country, to reduce addiction, and to do all those good things. It never happened, and it's created even a greater divide between um, poor people, and people of color, and the affluent who run the banks and, and commit crimes every day but who are never touched, while we have some poor schlep with with a, a marijuana cigarette getting 10 years in, in prison. It just makes no sense. Our law enforcement people have become addicted to the money that flows from the federal government into local coffers through drug enforcement. So how do local cops get federal funding? According to a 2011 report by the Brennan Center for Justice, the two biggest federal grant programs require local sheriffs to report their numbers of arrests and convictions, among other data, to apply for federal dollars. The DOJ takes this data and calculates the amount of money doled out to states and localities. Local sheriffs have learned how to game the system by pumping up their numbers. After the economic crash of 2008, local police forces faced budget shortfalls. So the DOJ pumped an additional $2 billion into the COPS program to help retain and hire more police officers nationwide. In 2009, the Riverside County Sheriff's Department received over $12 million from the COPS program to hire 50 police officers over the course of three years. One of those hires was Deputy Dan Zipperstein. The Riverside County Sheriff has an operating budget of about $500 million a year, but they're actually facing a shortfall. So arresting more kids and getting more money from the feds is totally in their interests. So this compound for the Riverside Sheriff's Department is pretty swank. Palm trees, a kind of this like curved modernist architecture, um, and it's spotless. And this is all taxpayer money that basically funds this kind of stuff. Our institutions have become corrupted by prohibition because of this federal money. And because of, of the creation of things like private prison systems, all they care about is their power and the money that comes to them from the federal government. The case of Jesse Sodgrass in Temecula, California is a, it is a perfect example. The Riverside Sheriff's undercover officer taught him how to buy and sell dope. Jesse had to leave that campus to score some dope. He couldn't find it on the campus. That tells you right there, there's no reason for the police to be undercover on that campus. They come in like stormtroopers because that is the culture that the drug war has brought to law enforcement. And that's exactly what they did in Jesse's case. And that's what happens in most, all of these school stings. They slap down the kids that are the weakest. You don't see them going after the bank president's kid. 
They don't, they don't ever get him. They get the minority kids and they get the autistic children. They allowed those undercover police officers to review these children's files. So they knew going in, Jesse Snodgrass was a special needs student. They knew that they could manipulate him and get an arrest. And now Jesse Snodgrass's arrest gets to go on the chalkboard. It goes, gets to get, go in that next federal report and it gets to be part of what is gonna bring the Riverside Sheriff's hundreds of thousands of dollars in new grants. Jesse had one thing going for him, a set of parents that said, I didn't send my child to school to learn how to buy and sell dope. They do it every year. They, they've done it, uh, I believe it's four years in a row now. It happened again this last year. And during this, they actually got a special needs student who was 15 for selling one Vicodin pill of his own Vicodin pills for $3. We expect to stop this practice, first in Riverside County, and then we want to see that happen nationally. We want what happened here to be so well known that anytime an administrator is approached by um, any police department about doing this, we want administrators to know that if they accept drug stings in their schools, they could personally be sued. If you abuse children, though, shame on you. If you abuse our children, God help you. We are suing um, Temecula Valley Unified School District. This was um, left the day after um, an article first appeared in the Press Enterprise newspaper. The very next day, we received this voicemail. Yes, this message is for Mr. and Mrs. Snodgrass. This is Senior Deputy District Attorney Blaine Hopp, Riverside County DA's office, calling. Mr. and Mrs. Snodgrass, I read what it is you had to say about Operation Gla uh, Glasshouse uh, to the newspaper Press Enterprise, Sarah Bird's reporting. And I'm just contacting you to make sure that the information you provided her was uh, true and accurate and correct because I think it will affect the way the district attorney's office deals uh, with your son's return date to court. If there are anything uh, that you were misquoted, uh, I would truly appreciate a phone call back. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you and your son on July 16th, 2003 in court. Thank you. So that's a not so veiled threat saying, take it back, otherwise I'm gonna go harder on you. That's how we took it. Jesse was expelled from Chaparral High School, but Doug and Catherine fought back against the school district to allow him to return. He's going to walk with the graduating class in June. What, what's that day gonna be like for you guys? Oh, I can't even Bittersweet. imagine. Bittersweet, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, because he actually missed his um, last year's graduation. The entire stadium was just filled with people a, an enormous crowd, and it was really painful. He was supposed to be there last yeah. year, and they took that away from him, and they tried to take it away from him permanently. The last chapter to his school experience is going to be when he participates in that graduation ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a huge milestone for a lot of people, I think. Jesse finally graduated from Chaparral High School in June of 2014. But Jesse's story, while infuriating, is just the tip of the iceberg. The war on drugs has victimized millions of Americans, and it won't stop until federal law changes. Full-scale legalization may be right around the corner, but cops are still zealously pursuing a war that makes them rich, reinforces institutionalized racism, and preys on the most vulnerable. Are these the last squeals of a dying regime fattened by prohibition? Or will the war on kids get worse before it gets any better?